tell me to pour. I believe it may have been Havelock Ellis who said, the absence of a flaw in beauty is itself a flaw. Please help yourself to milk or lemon. Before I begin, please permit me to make one thing clear. I've never considered myself beautiful. To me, I look as I always have. I look like me. But as they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I merely responded to what others believed. I grew up poor in circumstance. My mother not well acquainted with my father. Her pitiful income small and insufficient. And even as a tiny infant, I had a sense of having to take control of my own destiny. As a young child, I resolved to make my own way in the world as soon as the opportunity presented itself. It arrived when I was ten. My mother, having returned in the early hours following her usual bout of revelry from a nearby alehouse, lost her footing on a rug at the front door and came down heavily on the floor of the vestibule. As I observed her splayed out on the hall carpet, blood oozing from her head from my position at the top of the stairs, I concluded the time had come to look after myself. Fortune indeed was hard on this little girl. Too many years were spent in the wilderness, too many years picking potatoes, pilfering from supermarkets, sleeping in doorways, barely able to claw my way out of the gutter. And by my seventeenth year, I understood. The fragrant rose, so revered for its beauty, is often raised in excrement. The filigree cashmere shawl is merely the cast off of a goat. Nature blessed me with a refinement of feature and a daintiness of frame that others found pleasing. And what use is a talent if left untended? So it came to pass that one evening, well after ten, I found myself penniless and alone on a dark country road. I had some time earlier been in dispute with regards to payment for a service rendered, and I, well, the details are unnecessary, but having been ejected somewhat forcefully from a motor vehicle, my apparel was in some state of disrepair. I walked, low of spirits, in a direction I believed leading towards town, and was suddenly most heartened to set eyes upon a light shining in the not too distant horizon. Less than ten minutes later, I stood at the gates of a most stately abode. I walked up to the front door and I knocked, in earnest hope of a civil response. A chink of light shone out as the door opened slightly. I could just make out a pinched-faced, middle-aged woman. What is it you want? she rasped. <laughs> I wanted so many things that at first I found it difficult to reply. Uh, could you tell me where the nearest telephone might be? I said truly an absurd question. One, because the nearest telephone must surely be in her house. And two, who would I call? I had no acquaintances who would venture out on a stormy night to rescue me. Step into this light here and let me have a look at you. I stepped forward into the light, doing my utmost to look noble and refined, for experience had taught me that those who look most in need of help are bound to be the least likely to receive it. A moment passed. Remarkable, quite remarkable, I heard a whisper under her breath. Then she bade me enter a grand and welcoming hallway. Thank you, I said, and I truly meant it. She informed me the nearest telephone was seven miles away, as neither she nor her son had need of that form of communication, but she was prepared to offer me board and lodgings for the night. I explained to her that I was presently unable to pay. No matter, she said. To be in the company of such exquisite beauty is payment enough. Sit there by the fire whilst a room is prepared. I slept fitfully. Tense of my surroundings, aggravated at the events of the previous evening and in pain from having been so rudely ejected from the moving car. Day was breaking when sleep finally came. I woke suddenly at 8 a.m., when my landlady entered my room carrying a tray. Breakfast, she said, and please excuse the liberty, but I have taken your wet garments to be laundered. They should be ready in a couple of hours. I thanked her gingerly, 
and as I leant over to accept the breakfast tray, the neckline from the nightgown that she'd lent me pulled back and revealed black and blue bruising on my shoulder. Show me, she said, pulling up my sleeve. My arm, like my shoulder, was black and blue. Her eyes lit up. I knew it, she said, clapping her hands together. I knew it from the very first moment I set eyes on you. Then she fell on her knees at my bedside. Forgive me, my child, she said. And she reached a hand under the mattress and pulled out one single little green garden pea. See, she said. I did not see at all. We've been searching for a princess for such a long time. A real beautiful princess whose skin is so tender that she cannot sleep on any lump or bump. Dear princess, she said, dear sweet princess, will you consider marrying my son? Certainly. I could have run from the room, grabbed a coat or overgarment from the hook downstairs. I could have fled from the house and the strange little woman. But in the hearth, the fire burned so brightly, and an opportunity had presented itself. I bathed, took a small breakfast, dressed in my freshly laundered clothes, then went downstairs to meet my future husband. In a lounge room just off the hall, he sat in his dressing gown in an armchair by the fire. A man of about five and twenty, his face pale and round like a baby's, his hands like fat white marshmallows. Darling, said his mother, this is your future wife. He looked petulantly at me for a moment, then said, Mother, can you bring me more toast? That last lot was cold. More tea? Please, do have a cake. We married in June. It was a small wedding, myself, my husband and his mother. She had wanted it to be a larger celebration. We should show them, she said. Show all of them who made jibes about your frailty. We should have a big celebration and then they could come and see. They should come and see that you are marrying a beauty. You who they ridiculed as sport, are marrying a real princess. But my husband would sit in his chair, oblivious to everything but his stomach and the remote control. I wore white, a dress handmade by my new mother-in-law. She declared that white suited my countenance so well because it reflected my purity. My husband wore a suit in charcoal grey and shirt and tie and scarf, all chosen by his mother. The ceremony was short. Afterwards, we returned to the house for sherry and cake, and my husband watched the A-team on television. We honeymooned in a pretty hotel in Florence. My husband and I had one room, his mother another adjoining. One morning... I was standing on the hotel balcony looking out over the city and I was so lost in the spectacle that the words of Henry Miller crossed my mind. What seems nasty, painful, evil can become a source of beauty, joy and strength if faced with an open mind. Every moment is a golden one for him who has the vision to recognise it as such. Anyhow. I failed to hear my husband call me to pour his morning coffee. He called me several times and in the end he was forced to get up from his chair and come out onto the balcony to retrieve me. The exercise made him both short of breath and of temper. You ignored me, he said. You didn't listen. You think you don't need to listen to me, don't you? You think you're above me because you're so perfect. And he slapped me so hard across the face, I was barely able to keep my balance. I said nothing, merely returned his gaze. He was immediately full of remorse, and great big fat baby tears began to well up in his eyes. Don't tell mother, he said, burying his head in his hands. Please don't tell mother. Certainly, I could have collected my things, put on my shoes and fled from the pretty hotel and my strange new husband. 
But he seems so full of remorse, sobbing on the balcony wall of our hotel room in Florence. And an opportunity had presented itself. Such a long, long time ago. Such a long, long time. His mother did not fare well at the event of her son's death. How had he managed to fall out of a hotel window when he'd never previously been predisposed to stand too close to one lest he catch a chill? How could I answer? I barely knew him. Back in our grand house on the moors, she mourned the loss of a moon and her stars. She became reluctant to eat or to drink, and she was little for conversation. I really had no choice but to take matters into my own hands and consult a doctor. She was prescribed tranquilizers, which she refused to take. Instead, she was inclined to sit in his room of an evening, clutching his clothes and sobbing. And so, although sad, it really was a blessing that one evening, unsteadied by lack of food and having partaken of a couple of the tranquilizers and a little sherry, she lost a footing on a loose piece of carpet on the first floor landing and tumbled all the way down the stairs to the bottom. As I observed her splayed out on the floor of the vestibule, blood oozing from her nose, from my position at the top of the stairs, I pondered that had she bothered to have a telephone installed, I could have called an ambulance for assistance. True, of course, I could have gone off in the car on the off chance I might be able to find help, but an opportunity had presented itself. Poor sad woman. Poor mad woman. And such a long time ago. And in all that time I had no idea she had relatives. Certainly none she could have been in correspondence with. Please, do have another cake. They really are very good. I suppose if I tried exceptionally hard I could feel guilty. Well... <laughs> Any half-wit or imbecile can feel guilty. You see them on the television every morning. I've done this, boo-hoo. I've done that, poor me. I'm bad, but I've got my reasons. Why should I? I resolved to become a woman of means. And I have. No one asked me where I had come from. No one asked what I had been. They were only interested in what they saw as if aesthetic appearance means anything. Life has taught me, if you want happiness, don't expect it to come knocking on a dark and stormy night. Happiness has to be earned. You have to work. You really have to graft. If you're prepared to do that, there's no end to what you can achieve. And now you. You've come here with your theories and your concerns. True. I could have turned you away. I could have refused to answer the door. But an opportunity has presented itself. And instead, here we are together, having tea.